That's right, Sarah can take the question. Okay, uh, so it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Sarah uh, Newsom. So Sarah uh, was a student at McGill University uh, doing her master in astrophysics, uh, also in uh, Rabaul University. So Sarah was a visiting uh, pre fellow at the Center for Astrophysics in 2018. Uh, he, she worked with uh, Michael Johnson and uh, she completed uh, her PhD uh, at Rabaul under the supervision of Heino uh, Falcon. So she has recently uh, moved to Boston and is currently a NASA Einstein Fellow at the CFA. So as an observational astronomer, Sarah's research uh, centers around the collection, calibration, and analysis of uh, millimeter uh, wave radio observation of supermassive black holes. So uh, with that, uh, you know, thank you very much, Sarah. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Black Hole Pyre Project for inviting me to give this talk in this webinar um, series accompanied by these amazing uh, scientists who are really at the top in, in their fields. And I'm really honored to be part of this amazing uh, lineup. And I hope um, you can learn something from my talk today. So uh, as CK said, my focus is to talk to you about Sagittarius a star in the radio band. And uh, this beautiful image uh, that you can see in my title slide is by the Meerkat telescope in uh, uh, one gigahertz uh, radio. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this image uh, later in my talk, but it just came out a few days ago. So I had to make it my title slide because it's just incredible. It, it's the galactic center. Uh, so I'm a member of the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. Uh, I work on a very small part of the project, mainly observation, uh, uh, data processing, and imaging. And uh, the work I'll be presenting today uh, as part of the EHT uh, is made by a big group effort uh, across 300 plus members, uh, 60 institutes, 20 countries and regions in Europe, Asia, Africa, North and South America, EHT collaboration is very diverse. We are not just astronomers, there are engineers, computer scientists, uh, and, and lots of other people working on the project. And so I really wanted to highlight just the diversity uh, and the scale of the efforts uh, to present EHT results. So what are the goals of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration? We want to directly image black holes to test theories of gravity in the vicinity of a supermassive black hole. Because in a black hole environment, this is where we push you know, space and time to their absolute limit. And so if we want to test laws of physics, going into the most extreme environment where they can break down is really the best we can do. Uh, we want to connect horizon scale physics to launching mechanisms of relativistic jets. And we also want to connect horizon scale dynamics to multi-wavelength variability in flares, which this last point I'm sure you've heard all about in, in Daryl Haggard's amazing talk uh, the first talk of this uh, webinar series. So why are we interested in imaging a black hole? Why do we go through all this trouble uh, to, to understand supermassive black holes? Well, it's because supermassive black holes are ubiquitous in our universe. They reside in the centers of uh, galaxies. They eject these massive jets of plasma that pierce through entire galaxies and galaxy neighborhoods. And these jets are the most energetic process in the universe. They're extremely powerful. And we don't quite understand how they form. And it's quite amazing that when you think about you know, how big galaxies are, how much mass there is in the galaxy, the supermassive black hole in its center is extremely small compared to the galaxy scale. And it's also extremely light in terms of mass compared to the rest of the mass of the galaxy. So something so small and so little within the galaxy can create these amazing, you know, havocs across, you know, entire uh, uh, extra galactic media. So, you know, they're kind of amazing. Black holes are amazing. We don't really understand how they exist, where, how they form, how they create these jets. And so we want to answer these questions. And the best way to answer these questions is to see one up close. And so if we look at it up close, we can understand its properties, we can understand how it launches these jets, and this is what we want to do with the EHT. So how do we uh, understand how black holes look like up close? So there's a lot of work that goes into simulating a black hole in its environment, and I'll describe a little bit about the different components that come uh, around a supermassive black hole. 
So you might have seen, you know, the famous interstellar picture of this, you know, black hole with this kind of pancake disk like um, matter, this accretion disk uh, that accretes onto the black hole. Uh, this type of black hole is a high accretor, whereas the two black holes we want to image with the EHT are low luminosity AGN. They're very, very low accretors. They accrete very little. So uh, they don't have a pancake disk like interstellar. They have a puffy kind of gas cloudy disk around it, a thick disk. And it looks kind of uh, something like this. So you have here the accretion disk, which is more puffy, uh, so that the gas onto the black hole accretes very slowly and the black holes are starved. Uh, and this disk is threaded with magnetic fields because it, it's extremely hot gas and hot ions. And so you ha naturally have a rising uh, magnetic fields. And uh, these magnetic fields kind of thread through the disk. And the electrons in the gas also spiral uh, around magnetic fields and emit synchrotron radiation. And the synchrotron radiation uh, is polarized. And so we can understand uh, through polarization, we can understand the properties of the magnetic fields where these photons uh, uh, originate. And then uh, also uh, near the black hole, there is um, you know, uh, accretion of matter, but there is also ejection of matter. It gets ejected either in a kind of large scale outflow or relativistic jets in the case of the most powerful um, outflows. And these jets are also threaded with magnetic fields, which allow them to collimate and to extend at very, very large distances, like in these beautiful photos I showed earlier. Uh, so this is basically what we simulate here, uh, on top of also adding the effects of gravity, because you know, we're dealing with a supermassive black hole that bends space and time. So this is all the components that go into simulating uh, uh, black holes. And the state-of-the-art simulations that we use are called GRMHD. So GR stands for general relativistic, which means they include the effects of gravity on space and time. And uh, magnetohydrodynamics, magneto for magnetic fields and hydrodynamics for gas dynamics. So including gravity, magnetic fields, and gas dynamics to simulate black hole environments. So what is the black hole shadow? Where does it come from? So if you have a supermassive black hole that bends around its space and time, so this bend uh, creates deflections in the light rays that come around the black hole. So light rays that come too close fall into the black hole, but light rays that kind of scrape the black hole get kind of uh, deflected to some distance. And uh, from a distant observer, if you see many, many light rays, what you'll see is kind of a dark patch, which is the shadow of the black hole, and then a, a ring around it coming from the emitted light of this hot gas closest to the black hole. Now, if you remember our famous M87 star image, you'll notice that our uh, ring is not uniform. There is a brighter spot on the bottom. And this brighter spot is caused by Doppler boosting. So because you have gas rotating around the black hole, the part that comes closest uh, that comes towards us is brighter than the part that goes away from us. So think about the Doppler effect, like if you have an ambulance that goes past you, the frequency of the ambulance that you hear actually changes as it comes towards you and goes away from you. This is exactly the same thing with light. Light that is brighter um, is coming towards you and dimmer is going away from you. And depending on the inclination of the black hole, the level of Doppler boosting also changes. So you'll see it more uniform if it's uh, face on and uh, more boosted if it's inclined. So all of this information in the image actually tells us a lot of uh, information about the properties of the black hole and the gas around it. So the two uh, targets that we look at with the EHT are M87 star and Sagittarius A star. These are the two largest black holes on the sky. Uh, because their mass and distance are just big enough for us to be able to image uh, from Earth. But in order to test theories of gravity, there are a number of things we need to check off before we can do that. And these are really understanding the properties of the black hole themselves and the gas around it before we can really test out whether the shape of the shadow corresponds to certain theories of gravity. So Different things we need to know is the inclination of the black hole, the spin of the black hole. So is it spinning? Is it not? How fast is it spinning? Uh, what is the mass of the black hole, which also um, uh, influences the scale of the shadow? What is the distance, which also influences the scale of the shadow? 
and uh, the astrophysics around it. Uh, so what are uh, the gas properties around the black hole? How does the black hole accrete? Does it eject a jet? Uh, you know, uh, what are the properties of the gas? Are there accelerated electrons? You know, lots of different uh, physics there that also influence how the image looks. And in the case of Sagittarius A star, we also have to worry about scattering, which I'll talk about more later. So M87 star, Sagittarius A star, uh, how do we know these different you know, checklist items? So for M87 star, before we made our image, uh, we did not know the mass very well. We had two uh, different mass measurements from two different experiments. One was from gas dynamics, which had a mass of about three uh, billion solar masses, and one had, uh, an, and there was a stellar dynamic uh, measurement that measured a mass of about uh, six or seven billion solar masses. So we had a factor of two different in mass, which means that the shadow size could differ by a factor of two. And so uh, this was a difficult uh, question for us because if it was the lower mass, it would be much harder to image with the EHT. Uh, then the distance was known very accurately. The inclination was also known uh, very well because M87 has this amazing relativistic jet that comes from the center, uh, from the center of the galaxy, from the black hole. And this relativistic jet is actually the very first uh, astrophysical jet ever observed in 1918 by Curtis. This uh, it, jet was observed in the optical wavelength and was uh, kind of described as a stream of light coming from the M87 galaxy. And studies of these jets over several decades in the radio and optical uh, uh, understood you know, the properties of the dynamics of the flow of the jet and measured an inclination. The spin of the black hole, we don't know. And this astrophysical model, we know somewhat, again, thanks to its astrophysical jet and these studies, particularly across the radio band. Then for Sagittarius A star, um, in this next talk that you'll hear from uh, Andrea Gez, you'll know that we know it's mass and distance with really great accuracy. So this is really great for testing theories of gravity because knowing a black hole mass and distance gives really precise um, uh, predictions of what the shadow should look like. Uh, we don't know its inclination, we don't know its spin, and its astrophysical model is still a big debate uh, because of many reasons I'll explain very soon. And on top of all of this, we also have to worry about two more items. Variability, because a Sagittarius A star is 4 million solar masses, so it's a thousand times less massive than uh, M87, which means the gas around the black hole is moving much, much faster. And it flares, and it's kind of a crazy environment uh, that we have to deal with. And we also have to deal with scattering, because Sagittarius A star is in our own galaxy. Uh, in the center of our galaxy. So we have to look through our own galaxy to be able to see it. And unfortunately, there is a cloud of ionized gas between us and the galactic center, um, kind of midway, uh, that is blocking our view in the radio. So the EHT observed uh, M87 star and Sagittarius A star in 2017. The M87 star data we've published already. We've published these amazing total intensity images and polarization images that gave us lots of information about M87. We observed um, the two black holes in 2017 with these telescopes. Uh, we have six different locations, six single dish telescopes and two phased arrays. Uh, but we didn't observe alone. You've heard a lot about this from Daryl, but we have a lot of multi-wavelength partners because to understand properties of supermassive black holes, we really need a full view of the black holes across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So we observed in high energy, uh, gamma ray, x-ray, infrared, uh, in the radio with interferometers, and in radio with very long baseline interferometry. So what I'll be focusing on in my talk are the radio uh, observations, not just during 2017, but also throughout history and what they've taught us about Sagittarius A star. So I'll just uh, flip back to M87 and tell you a little bit about our EHT journey to put into context why Sagittarius A star is different. So M87 is a galaxy in the Virgo cluster. It is 55 uh, million light years away from us. And uh, it has you know, this stream of light sitting in the optical that comes from the first ever observed astrophysical jet. And the stream of light, if you look at it in radio uh, with you know, better and better interferometers, higher resolution, uh, 
uh, shorter and shorter wavelengths so that you see more and more higher energy photons and you uh, go all the way down and follow this jet to its center. This is where we imaged it with the EHT and you see the black hole shadow. Uh, this dark patch with this ring of illuminated gas brighter on the bottom. So uh, in order to see M87 and Sagittarius A star, we need a telescope that is really big. So the predicted sizes for these sources, knowing kind of roughly the mass of M87 and knowing very accurately the mass and distance of the first star, we can predict what is the instrument that we need in order to make this image. So the predicted size of M87, which was the uh, upper limit for the resolution that we needed is 20 to 40 microseconds. So the angular resolution we need is 20 microseconds in order to see M87. And of course, Sagittarius A star is a little bit bigger, so this resolution is perfect for Sagittarius A star 2. We are observing wavelengths in order to see um, through uh, all of the gas and dust between us and the centers of these galaxies is 1.3 millimeters, because the gas, the accretion disk and gas flow around the black holes is optically thin at this frequency. Uh, and uh, we are able to actually see the uh, closest gas around the shadow of the black hole. So 1.3 millimeters. The telescope size is proportional to these two. Uh, and so we can calculate how big the telescope has to be, which is 13 million meters. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a telescope that is 13 million meters wide. It would be great if we did. It would save us a lot of hassle. But unfortunately, we don't. Luckily, though, um, it's quite an amazing coincidence when you think about it, because these two black holes are about the same size on the sky, and we have something just below our feet that is this size, it's the Earth. And it's quite incredible how all of this kind of pieced together. So we can use the Earth to synthesize a virtual telescope. And this is what we did with the EHT, and this is what we do also with very long baseline interferometry arrays. We connect telescopes around the world that observe simultaneously at large distances from each other at different locations and different orientations so that we can probe different parts of the image on the sky. And we can construct a virtual telescope the size of the Earth this way. The technique that we use uh, that has been really key uh, for observations of Sagittarius ASAR across the whole radio band is very long baseline interferometry. So I'll briefly explain how this works. So if we have a source on the sky that is very far away, it emits plane waves as they arrive on Earth. We have, a tele uh, we have telescopes on Earth that are separated by large distances. The distance between different telescopes uh, projected onto the plane of the sky is called a baseline length. So we have this plane waves and we have a baseline distance between the telescopes. Now, because of the Earth's curvature, the uh, signals arrive at different times at different telescopes. So you will see the uh, signal, uh, if you follow one of these lines, you will see that uh, it will arrive at the telescope at the bottom before it arrives at the telescope at the top. So there is a time difference, a time delay between the arrival of these signals. But observing what happens at black holes, reconstructing the image or properties of the black hole, we really need simultaneity. We need every telescope to see the exact same signal at the exact same time uh, at the time that it left the black hole. And so uh, we need to measure this time difference. So what we do is use atomic clocks uh, called uh, hydrogen lasers. They're about the size of a mini fridge, very heavy, very expensive, but very useful. Uh, what these masers do, uh, they're, they're super accurate clocks that lose about a second every million years. And so these clocks time tag the signal arriving at each telescope. And what we do is not combine the signals directly as we receive them. We record the signals, the time tag signals onto standard you know, helium hard drives. So we essentially freeze the light that arrives at each telescope, record it onto hard drives, and then play it back later once we combine all the data from each telescope. And through accurate measurements at each telescope of the different arrival times and possible delays in the instrument and a lot of calibration, we can realign all of the signals uh, between the telescopes and reconstruct every signal that they see in common for every pair of telescopes, for every baseline. So by combining many different telescopes at different locations and at different distances, 
we can reconstruct different features in the image. So telescopes close together tell us about large scale structure, they see more signal in common, and telescopes far apart see less signal in common, they tell us about finer scale structure in the image. So when the EHT got built, uh, after years and years of boring more and more telescopes, in 2017, we finally had enough that actually probed enough different directions and different scales in the image in order to reconstruct an actual image of the black hole. So this is what we did. Here's the M87 black hole. Uh, you have the dark patch at the center, this bright ring uh, brighter on the bottom. Um, because the shadow of the black hole uh, scales with mass, and we know its distance very well for M87, we were able to measure a mass directly from our image. And this was measured to be six and a half billion solar masses. So more consistent with the stellar dynamics measurement. We also were able to measure the circularity of uh, Oh, yeah, we um, also compared the black hole image with the GRMHD simulations. And this is what our library looks like. So how well were we able to replicate this image? So we have an extensive library of simulations. Uh, these simulations scale with black hole mass. So uh, they are uh, the same sets for M87 and Sagittarius A star because they're very similar black holes, but they just evolve on different scales because of the mass difference. Uh, so this is what our library looks like. And you'll notice that every single model here has a dark patch in the center and a ring around it that has you know, some sort of bright patch somewhere. So this property is actually very easily replicated because of gravity. The shadow of the black hole and its bright ring is almost entirely effects of the gravitational pull of the black hole. And so it's not telling us so much about the astrophysics, even though all of these models probe different astrophysics, it's really just telling us about gravity. And so it was very easily reproducible by our models. And so how did we rule out different uh, types of astrophysics for M87? Well, we have to look in the multi-wavelength. So these are amazing multi-wavelength uh, observations during our 2017 campaign. Everything is fine by the EHT multi-wavelength paper that came out last year. Uh, and you can see here our, our radio observations of the M87 jet across different uh, wavelengths. And there's also the multi-wavelength effort uh, outside of radio here. The astrophysical jet was very important in order to rule out uh, different astrophysics. And I'll show a little bit uh, how that's done. So longer wavelength radio especially informs jet physics. So it tells us about how much power there should be in the jet, uh, how much accretion there should be onto the black hole. And so many theoretical models are able to reproduce the EHT signatures that we saw in total intensity, this image, but they could not make it past multi-wavelength, uh, particular X-ray and also broadband radio jet constraints. So I'll show you how, how that happens. These are all the models that we tested in our total intensity papers in 2019. Uh, these are all different models with different types of astrophysics. So the EHT image uh, ruled out these models. Then the thin disk limit so, uh, ruled out these models. So I, I mentioned you know, that M87 is not a big accretor. So if you have um, a disk that is too thin, it won't uh, pass the test because the disk around M87 has to be thick for the black hole to accrete very slowly. Uh, then these were ruled out by the X reflex. And then finally, these were ruled out by the large scale jet. So the multi-wavelength information uh, that we have on M87 were really crucial to rule out certain astrophysics uh, in the models when every model were able to re uh, reproduce you know, this uh, gravity signature in the image. Of course, uh, the polarization results that came out last year probe the astrophysics of the uh, black hole a lot deeper than the total intensity. I won't go into too much detail now because I wanna focus on total intensity, uh, but uh, there are really magnetic fields and polarization uh, really, really put very tight constraints on the astrophysics. So now that you understand our EHT journey, I'm gonna switch gears uh, to, to talk to you about the supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star and how it is different from M87 and why we have a much harder time dealing with it than M87. So 
This picture is one of my favorite radio photos ever made. It's by the Meerkat uh, telescope in South Africa. Uh, the Meerkat is a prototype for the square kilometer array, which I'm sure you've heard all about. Uh, so this is the galactic center. And uh, the fact that the supermassive black hole is in our galaxy gives us a much uh, richer view of black hole environments. Because unlike M87, which is in a galaxy really far away, uh, Sagittarius A star is right in our home galaxy. So we happen to have lots of multi-wavelength information and monitoring of a really busy environment. And we don't just see whatever happens closest to the black hole or, uh, or uh, emitting from the black hole. We also get to see all of the gas and dust and bubbles and streams and flares and stars and winds that all happen right near Sagittarius A star. So uh, the Sagittarius A region is actually this kind of uh, bright uh, radio spot here. Now, uh, my title slide was this image, which was just released a few days ago, again, for Meerkat. This is a uh, 30 centimeter wavelength, so much longer wavelength than EHT. Uh, so we're looking at kind of the inner galactic center. There's this radio arc here. And uh, Sagittarius A is here. So let's zoom in a little bit more uh, with the very large array. Uh, so the VLA is a little bit uh, shorter wavelengths. We're looking at six centimeter wavelengths, kind of zooming in to the Sagittarius A region. Uh, here we have you know, these streams that come out from uh, the galactic center mini spiral. And you see these three uh, mini spiral arms here that um, are, are these gas flows that also orbit uh, the, the black hole. And Sagittarius A star is right in here. So I want to uh, take you a little bit on a journey about learning about Sagittarius A star and, and how we learned about it in the radio. So here's again the mini spiral, again with the VLA, but this time a little bit shorter wavelength, so at 1.3 centimeters. Inside this region resides the supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star. It's a radio source. And it coincides with the position uh, uh, centroid at which these S stars orbit. Uh, these S stars that are observed by the Keck UCLA uh, Galactic Center group led by Andrea Gez and uh, the Gravity Collaboration uh, led by Reinhard Gensel. And you might be familiar with these names. Uh, Andrea is the next speaker in the series and she will talk all about this so I won't go into much detail. Uh, but they also are the winners of the uh, 2020 uh, Nobel Prize in Physics uh, for their work on these stars uh, around the supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star. So because these uh, stellar orbits are tracked with great precision, uh, they were able to measure the supermassive black hole mass and distance with really great accuracy. And by great accuracy, I mean, I know the mass of Sagittarius A star with better precision than I know my own mass. That's how well uh, they're doing. Um, but then what does Sagittarius A star actually look like in the radio? If you were to dive deep like we do in M87, you know, go to shorter and shorter wavelengths, what are we looking at? So from previous uh, experiments, uh, the size of Sagittarius A star is expected to be 50 microseconds, so a little bit larger than M87 which corresponds to about five Schwarzschild radii at, at one millimeter, the, free, the wavelength at which we observe with the EHT. But we don't know the orientation of the black hole. We don't know if it's spinning. And there is a long-standing debate about where its radio emission comes from. What is the emission process that dominates in the radio? Is it the accretion disk around Sagittarius A star? Or is there a jet that we've actually never seen? So while Sagittarius A star and M87 are quite similar, in terms of you know, types of black holes and how they accrete, Sagittarius A star accretes uh, a little bit less. So it's a little bit more starved than M87. And M87, even though it's starved, it's, about, it's able to launch this big radio jet, which is incredibly important for our astrophysical modeling. But for Sagittarius A star, we've actually never seen this jet in the radio ever. So we don't know whether it's there, and we may have some evidence that there is something, but we've never seen it. And of course, the next step is to see what the black hole shadow looks like. 
This is upcoming work by the EHT collaboration at one millimeter. So uh, this picture you've probably heard uh, from Daryl in her last her talk. Uh, this is the spectral energy distribution of Sagittarius A star. So basically, luminosity over frequency, and um, you know uh, this basically shows that to understand Sagittarius A star, much like M87, we really need multi wavelength uh, uh, modeling, and especially because Sagittarius A star is variable, we need simultaneous coverage at all times. <laughs> to understand the black hole, because in a few minutes, it changes completely. Whereas for M87, it, during an entire day, it will not move because it's so massive that the gas around it moves really, really slowly. Um, because you know the more massive the supermassive black hole, the slower the time around it. So the black hole, uh, the gas around the black hole moves much slower for M87 and for Saturday star, whereas M87, uh, for a whole day would look totally the same. It would not change at all on the sky. For a Sagittarius A star, within five minutes, it could look completely different. So there's another uh, really difficult hurdle that we have to deal with. Uh, and then in the radio, uh, we can look at this kind of uh, radio uh, um, spectrum here that has this uh, slope. This is power law for synchrotron radiation. And uh, the slope tells us that uh, the gas around the black hole becomes optically thinner at higher frequency or shorter wavelength. Uh, and you have this uh, bump in the millimeter region uh, where it's optically thin. Uh, this radio emission, uh, this broadband radio emission, is really hard to model if you don't have a jet inside the Terrace A star. So in the modeling, if you don't have some sort of outflow or jet, radio jet coming out, it's very hard to fit this data that we observe. But in the images, there is no jet. We don't see it. So where is it uh, is another, it's like one of the big questions uh, for Sagittarius A star. So let's take you on a little bit of a timeline, the galactic center across the radio band. So Sagittarius A star was first detected, uh, the radio source uh, was first detected in the galactic center at 11 and 3.7 centimeters by Bellick and Brown in 1974. Uh, this is an image of their detection. It's a point source. Uh, Sagittarius A star is, is right here. Uh, in 1975, by Lowe et al., there was the first VLBI detection of the radio source. And I mentioned that VLBI plays a really important role in understanding the uh, images of Sagittarius A star across the radio band. And this was the very first time that there was a detection in VLBI that opened up a whole new realm of VLBI imaging of Sagittarius A star. In 1982, Brown actually named the non-thermal radio source Sagittarius A star. So before it was just called the radio source in the Sagittarius A region. And so uh, it was called Sagittarius A star in 1982. And Brown actually said that he added the star because uh, he liked the notation from atomic physics. So in atomic physics, you have you know, these high energy state atoms that have a little star on it to indicate their high energy. And so he added a star to Sagittarius A uh, in order to mention that it's the radio source uh, that is high energy that energizes this uh, environment around it. So this is why it's called Sagittarius A star. And the EHT um, reprised this notation to name the radio source, the black hole in M87, naming it M87 star. Uh, so in 1985, there was the first observation of an elongated structure at 3.6 centimeters. So Lo et al imaged the uh, Sagittarius A star on the sky and found that it was elongated towards the east-west direction. Then um, observations across the whole uh, uh, long wavelength radio band from 30 to 1.3 centimeters showed that the size frequency relation is actually consistent with scattering. This was work by John C. et al. in 1989. This actually told us that the size of the source scaled uh, with uh, wavelength squared. So basically, the size would decrease as a, a function of wavelength squared. And it was always elongated in the east-west direction, uh, just kind of a blob elongated in the east-west direction. This was basically the start of the Sagittarius A star blobology 
uh, which is, you know, just seeing blobs at all wavelengths in the radio. But uh, although, you know, blobs may be boring, they teach us a lot. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later. In 1994, Rogers et al. got the first VLBI detection at three millimeters. This is now we're leaving the centimeter wave behind and looking at three millimeter uh, data in the millimeter range. So we're getting to the optically thinner uh, images of Sagittarius star. Then in 1998, Christbaum et al. published the first VLBI detection at one millimeter. So Sagittarius star is detectable at high, at high frequency or short wavelength. So we can start to really get uh, more information. And what, we, what they found is that the source size on the sky actually deviated a little bit from this uh, size frequency relation at one millimeter. What does that mean? I'll tell you more about that later. Then uh, in Dillman et al. in 2008 uh, published the first proto-EHT observations of Sagittarius A star. Using only three sites, uh, there was a first kind of uh, detection in the high resolution of the black hole Sagittarius A star. And this really opened up, started up, you know, the entire journey uh, that will uh, become the Event Horizon Telescope. Then in um, 2015, Johnson et al. published the first results polarization inside a star with the proto-EHT. And I mentioned polarization is a very important discriminant for astrophysics around the black hole. So this will be another uh, really important milestone. And then the highest resolution observations of Sagittarius A star to date uh, was published by Lou et al. 2018 with the proto-EHT. And uh, this kind of hinted that the uh, source on the sky was more consistent with kind of a ring-like shape than a, a Gaussian blob. And this uh, shape was, again, a little bit larger than what you'd expect from the size frequency relation. So what are we supposed to look at at 1.3 millimeters, the, the wavelength at which we look at with the EHT? So I mentioned that the origin of the radio emission in Sagittarius A star is still un unknown. At 1.3 millimeters, because we're in the optically thin uh, regime, the shadow, just like M87, is really the dominating feature in the image. So if you have something where the radio emission comes from the accretion disk, like here, or from a jet, like here, if you were to image both of these with the EHT, you would get a very similar image. You would get a kind of more crescent uh, ring brighter on the left side, and you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Uh, this is really because the gravity, the gravitational pull of the black hole around the gas that is orbiting it is really the dominating feature in the image. Uh, just like what we see with the M87 image. So we need to zoom out, just like for M87, we need to look at you know, um, longer wavelength radio. So if we zoom out into the accretion flow, see more of the optically thicker gas, we start to see differences. Here, the accretion disk dominated emission is kind of more uh, symmetrical, whereas the jet dominated is more elongated. Uh, so if we were to image these two models at three millimeters, uh, we would be able to tell differences. Uh, and if we go to longer wavelengths, we go beyond the realm of GRMHD simulations because these really simulate kind of the closest environment around black holes. And uh, there's a lot of work right now to make it go into larger scales, but we're not there yet. Uh, so three millimeters seems like the perfect place to look, right? We're close enough to the black hole to see the gas closest to it. Uh, and we're also far enough so that the gravity is not the dominating feature. We, the gas is actually influencing the image shape. But like I mentioned, because Sagittarius A star is in the center of our galaxy, we have to deal with interstellar scattering. And so because of this ionized gas between us and the galactic center, uh, the images of Sagittarius A star in the radio are contaminated. So if I were to scatter these two models with what we know about interstellar scattering, this is what they would look like. And so now we're back to square one. We cannot tell them apart. If you were to see this on the sky, you wouldn't be able to tell if it's accretion disk or dead dominated model, even though three millimeters is the best place to look. And on top of that, if you go to longer wavelengths where there's more and more of the gas, the scattering gets worse. Uh, you know, longer wavelengths is even more scattered than three millimeters. So three millimeters is really kind of the sweet spot 
where we can get enough of a sense of the uh, of the structure of the gas, but interstellar scattering is really getting in the way. So we can lift the veil on Sagittarius A star with longer wavelength uh, radio. I mentioned earlier that there have been decades of studies of the shape of Sagittarius A star on the sky. And these decades of studies taught us that the size of the, uh, of the uh, scattered image on the sky scales with wavelength squared. So the scattering is actually chromatic. It changes with, uh, with observing wavelength. At three millimeters is where the intrinsic size is comparable to this blurring kernel that is constantly blurring our source towards the east-west. It stretches it in the east-west direction. And at one millimeters, where we see this kind of deviation from this lambda squared uh, law is because the intrinsic size dominates. The scattering is just a little bit blurring the image, but the actual overall source size is actually just dominated by the actual uh, you know, shape of, of the ring, of the shadow. So at one millimeter would be the best place to image, but because the source is variable and scattering is also variable, we need to understand all of the properties of the scattering throughout the whole radio band in order to correct it. Then uh, at 1.3 centimeters uh, by Gwyn et al. in 2014 was the first detection of this refractive substructure. So on top of this blurring, the interstellar medium also has you know, these over densities uh, in it. And these over densities create little patches, little ripples in the image that create these kind of false structure at very high resolution. So if, for example, with the EHT, if you're looking to uh, observe very high resolution structures, things like you know, uh, the, the shadow, the ring around it, or different you know, photon ring signatures around the black hole, we really need very, very high resolution. But if you're picking up the substructure in the image that is actually coming from the scattering, uh, that is faking, you know, fine structure, hot spots, boosting, you're kind of misinterpreting your view because of the scattering contamination. And so understanding these properties is really crucial. And it was uh, first detected in the centimeter wavelengths. So how do we extrapolate to shorter wavelengths? What does this refractive structure look like at 1.3 millimeters? Is this you know, a kind of easy um, uh, transferable property? Is it also uh, wavelength dependent? Uh, we don't know. So there's more to worry about. Depending on the scattering theory, interstellar scattering can contaminate the tests of gravity we want to do with EHT images. So we have two models uh, showing the two most extreme differences this Johnson 2018 model and this Goldreich and Shridhar 2006 model. If we were to scatter a simple ring at one millimeters with these two models, the Johnson 2018 one has uh, kind of the same blurring that we've observed in longer wavelength radio. And it has uh, some substructure that is frequency dependent uh, that matches the 1.3 centimeter measurement, but that is quite low at 1.3 millimeters. So the scattered ring would look like this. So you would have a nice ring. You can see the blurring in the east-west where it's more faded here than in the north-south. And you see these little ripples from refractive structure. Uh, but the shape of the ring is still recoverable if this were the real scattering. Then this Goldreich and Schrindhar model has really high levels of refractive substructure. And it's about the same across frequency. And so uh, it has the same blurring, but the refractive structure does this to the ring. And so uh, this is work by, done by uh, Zoe Zhu in 2009, uh, 2019. Uh, and you will see that the structure of the ring is very hard to recover. If this were the scattering that we see on the sky with the EHT, it's, it's quite devastating <laughs> that, that um, the test of, of gravity we want to do would be you know, very, very difficult. And unfortunately, both scattering models fit observational constraints before 2017. Uh, at three millimeters, this is what they look like. So they have the same diffractive blurring, this bending of the waves through the interstellar medium, and they have different refractive substructure. So these over densities causing the waves to bend. So at three millimeters, if we could have long baseline information, we could actually pick up on different refractive properties. It would be low level for J18 and high level for GSS6. 
And then after modeling the scattering, we can actually remove it and get an intrinsic image. So we can reconstruct an unscattered image with a, a code called stochastic optics developed by Michael Johnson. This is similar to adaptive optics, but we do it in post-processing. So we have an intrinsic image on the sky. Uh, it, this image has diffractive blurring that blurs it in east to west direction predominantly. And it has a refractive noise that adds this substructure. And we can remove it by modeling the scattering kernel that we know very well through longer wavelength radio and stochastically varying refractive noise that cause these ripples. So we solve for the stochastic variations in the screen and then deconvolve with the scattering kernel to get an intrinsic image. So we observed Sagittarius SR at three millimeters with 27, in 2017, 2018 with the global millimeter VLBI array. These are all the stations we used using obviously the technique of VLBI. We had the participation of ALMA for the first time and ALMA was really a game changer for sensitivity north-south coverage and long baselines. And these are really all crucial uh, to detect this refractive structure and understand properties of scattering in millimeter uh, wavelengths. So we had one observation in 2017, two in 2018. This is a flux as a function of projected baseline lengths. So short baselines give large structure, long baselines give short scale structure. Everything past this point, all of these kind of, um, uh, Rhombuses are all new from ALMA that we've never had before. So if you look at this baseline here, this is ALMA GBT uh, flux density, uh, which is similar for both years. This is the most um, sensitive baseline in our data. You'll see that it, it's a little bit high and it falls actually right along the minor axis of the image. And it's actually a little bit uh, shallower than a Gaussian source. So uh, these dashed lines tell us the Gaussian model, uh, Gaussian model assumption on the sky. And this is telling us that the source on the sky is actually not a Gaussian. And for many decades of, wave, of longer wavelength imaging of Sagittarius star, we've always assumed a Gaussian source structure and proof that it is not. Then uh, here are the really high resolution detections. Uh, these are most likely refractive noise, refractive substructure in the image. And you'll see that the level is actually matching with this J18 model, and it's quite lower than the GSS6 model for both years. Uh, then we created an image. So we use a technique called aperture synthesis. I really like this kind of demo that we did for M87 that shows how this works. So the Earth rotation helps us fill a virtual mirror, and we combine data on multiple temporal and spatial scales as more stations see the source to reconstruct an image. Uh, so this is what we do for Sagittarius A star at three millimeters. Aperture synthesis though breaks for one millimeter uh, observations of Sagittarius A star because the source is so variable that over the span of the about eight hours that we look at it, it actually changes significantly. So um, this technique is very difficult to apply on Sagittarius A star itself uh, at one millimeters. But at three millimeters, it's a lot slower. And so we could do it. Uh, so we reconstructed a first image, first intrinsic image of Sagittarius star at three millimeters, which looks like this. So it's kind of a symmetrical source. We measured the radio emission uh, from at three millimeters to come about 12 Schwarzschild radii of the black hole. So really, really close to the black hole. Uh, we tested it against these different models, disk dominated or jet dominated uh, radio emission. We found that disk dominated models fit really well with the data uh, with different inclinations as well. But jet dominated models with inclinations larger than 20 degrees had to be rolled out because they were more elongated than what we measure in our image. And all the detections at three millimeters ruled out in this GSS6 scattering model for sighted star. This was really encouraging for EHT science. Uh, and uh, this J18 model seemed to fit very well with every uh, measurement in the radio to date. We also, uh, in the latest paper last year, combined three millimeter scattering constraints with other constraints from longer wavelengths. And we actually showed that this J18 scattering model, uh, the single scattering model can explain behavior in both the centimeter and millimeter regime. This is really great because it means we can extrapolate it to one millimeter with the EHT. So going back to our mini spiral, you know, we have these stellar orbits uh, around this uh, gravitational center. Uh, we're getting closer and closer here with more optically thinning image at three millimeters. And the next step in the journey is, of course, what does it look like at one millimeter? And I won't uh, talk about that. 
So just to summarize of my talk, uh, so Sagittarius A star and its environment really offer an exciting look into black hole physics, way more than M87, because there's just so much work going on in the galactic center that we can see. And we can see uh, so much more information about how the black hole interacts with its environment. Unlike M87 star, imaging Sagittarius A star really requires a deep understanding of variability and interstellar scattering. And observations across the radio band are really crucial to disentangle scattering and intrinsic source structure. This is why monitoring in the radio is really important. And observations at three millimeters are really the sweet spot to connect one millimeter observations with uh, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope. And finally, I want to have this takeaway point that a wealth of information still remains to be extracted in longer radio wavelengths to understand the accretion flow of Sagittarius A star and the scattering in the interstellar medium. And um, really exciting work in, in that line uh, will be coming soon. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah, for the great talk. Uh, so we have you know, a lot of questions in the uh, Q&A. Should we go through them uh, one by one? Or? Yeah, I, I can't see them now. Oh, can I open them? OK. Yeah. Uh, do you want yep. to read them out? Uh, sure. So, so the first question is from uh, Martin. So what are the odds that Sagittarius star is a wormhole and is there a way to test it with the current observations? Uh, right, that is an interesting question. So I think there were some discussions about that in the M87 papers, just because the M87 uh, uh, image could rule out some kind of uh, more exotic physics, but not much. Uh, and I think uh, there was some discussion that there was certain classes of wormholes that were ruled out uh, from the M87 image. I don't know much about the specifics uh, there, uh, but for Sagittarius SR, I think we usually assume, you know, Occam's razor that uh, the, uh, the properties uh, that we observe should be kind of the simplest scenario, which is a black hole. Uh, but of course, there's always room for more exotic theories. And I think uh, as we improve the resolution of our images, not just the ones we did at one millimeter, but we're also now going to uh, shorter wavelengths this year at uh, 0.8 millimeters. So even sharper images will have higher resolution, eventually also going into space, expanding uh, the array with uh, space arrays and increasing the resolution, we'd have finer and finer images. And there we'd really be able to constrain tighter and tighter the shape of the shadow and how these different exotic objects project different signatures for the sheet. Okay, thank you, Sarah. So the second question is about uh, why the orbiting matter around the black hole forms as a disk below a sphere. Oh, right. Uh, that is a, a great question. So uh, this is just from conservation of the momentum. So because the gas around the black hole, uh, because well, the gas that falls around the black hole, it falls down in some speed and will end up orbiting the black hole. And in order to, to orbit it efficiently and, slide and, and fall into the black hole, it will you know, form this kind of disk. Depending on the density of the gas and different temperature properties, et cetera, uh, the type of disk is also different. So you have thin disks, slim disks, puffy disks, thick disks, you know, there's lots of different types of, of, uh, of gas disks that can form around different black holes. And you can have different types of disks around uh, stellar mass black holes, for example, in X-ray binaries and supermassive black holes. There are also uh, quasar black holes that are really high accretors that have this kind of interstellar pancake disk, whereas uh, the low luminosity AGN, like I mean, seven inside a star have more of a thick disk and it's more puffy. Okay, thank you. So the next question is from uh, Burke. A, a, so the question is a few months ago, uh, Burke read a article about uh, instead of a supermassive black hole at the center of Milky Way, it could be a amount of uh, dark matter. So is there any observation finding to support this hypothesis? Uh, yeah, I think I did hear about this paper. Um, so I think, 
I have to think about this a little bit. So I think the, the complication would be how to fit this amount of dark matter in such a compact region. So we measure the area around the black hole to be extremely compact. Uh, so the radio emission is always coinciding with the centroid uh, of orbits of these S stars. And uh, we always measure the radio emission as we go to shorter and shorter wavelengths to be extremely compact. So it's about 15 Schwarzschild radii in, uh, at three millimeters, 12 to 15. And at one millimeters, we've measured it to be about five Schwarzschild radii, which is extremely compact. And putting 4 million solar masses of dark matter in this size seems very unlikely. Uh, it would have to be a black hole. Okay, thank you. So the next question is a observational one. So for one observation uh, run, how much data do you use for calibrate and uh, image analysis since we have so many telescopes? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So we uh, recorded about three and a half petabytes of data during the 2017 campaign. About one petabyte of that is the M87 data uh, in full polarization. And then about I would say another um, 1.5 petabytes of that is Sagittarius A star. And then the rest is some a few other sources. Um, and the data are essentially um, averaged uh, over time and frequency to build signal to noise. And so uh, in the end, we end up with data files that are about a few hundred megabytes. Those that are used in imaging are about a few hundred megabytes, but the process to reduce this data is very long and also requires a uh, very precise um, calibration in order not to destroy the signal. Because if you, uh, what we observe on the sky are visibilities, they have a phase and an amplitude. And if you average uh, uh, visibilities together, if your phases are misaligned or scrambled, you, uh, you average your amplitudes and you end up destroying your signal because you have destructive interference, basically. And uh, we need those phases to be perfectly uh, stable in order to average the signal and build up sensitivity to detect, especially the really weak signal that comes from the shadow uh, that are really critical to model the shape of the, of the sports on the sky. Um, so averaging is really important. We don't usually image with one petabyte of data. There's a really long process that goes into uh, how refine how we refine and average the data to build signal. Okay, thank you. So the next question is about: uh, Do we have any constraint on how supermassive black hole is gaining mass every year, or if black hole uh, black hole strato will grow or not? Uh, right. So we do know that black holes definitely grow. Uh, there, uh, the most common way for them to grow a little bit is to accrete mass. Uh, so they eat up you know, some uh, portion of solar masses per year. Uh, Sagittarius A star and M87 star are very low accretors. They accrete something like, I don't know, 10 to the minus five to 10 to the minus seven solar masses uh, per year, very, very little. But there are supermassive black holes that accrete a whole lot uh, uh, near the Eddington limit, especially these big, uh, quasars that accrete in these thick disks, they grow quite fast. You know, they can eat up you know, a few uh, uh, solar masses per year. Um, but how they grow in much larger scale, I think uh, there's still a lot of mystery around that, how, especially how supermassive black holes form. I think the current best understanding is through black hole mergers uh, or galaxy mergers. So if you have black holes, uh, you know, um, you know, a thousand solar masses or 10 to the four solar masses as black as galaxies merge, the supermassive black holes merge as well to create, a, you know, 10 to the six, 10 to the seven solar masses. I mean, seven is 10 to the nine, so billion solar masses. Uh, it's actually one of the most massive supermassive black holes that we know of in the universe. Uh, so uh, it, I think the easiest scenario is really these galaxy mergers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have uh, three very interesting questions from uh, Mark Seaton. 
So the first one is you mentioned earlier that uh, the Doppler shifting gives rise to the brightness asymmetry in the MED7 image, but doesn't uh, Doppler shift affect the frequency rather than the brightness? Um, that's a good question. Um, So it does affect the frequency, uh, but we observe at a specific uh, observing frequency. And so the light rays that come towards us uh, at the observing frequency appear brighter than the ones uh, going away from us at the same observing frequency. So mm -hmm. uh, there are, uh, Uh, yeah, that, I think that's right. Yeah, because we observe at a specific uh, tuned frequency. We don't yeah, so observe over a range of frequency. That, that's right. So I guess you, when the emission depends on the frequency, then when you shift, then you can see different brightness. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, the second question from Mark is, uh, wouldn't it be safe to assume the rotation of the black hole would be similar to the galactic disk, or is there no relationship? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, the galactic center is really crowded with lots of different things orbiting at different directions. So the galactic plane is in a certain kind of direction. I think it's kind of this, this direction that we see it. Uh, and uh, this is really on like parsec scales in the galactic center or kiloparsec even for the galactic plane. As you go inside, you will see different kind of disks or different uh, orbits of stars uh, at different orientations. We're still talking about something like 10,000, 100,000 Schwarzschild radii, much further than what we're looking at in the short wavelength radio. If you were to zoom in all the way to the black hole, uh, there's absolutely no reason why anything at like 10,000 Schwarzschild radii should impact the orientation of the black hole at like five short shield radii. The scale is so different that they could just be as disconnected as they could be. So uh, this, this is really tricky because it would be great if we had something like for M87 where we have the jet that really goes to the black hole. We had something that tells us a little bit more about the inclination and orientation, but we don't really happen to do that. This is why the three millimeter observations are so interesting because uh, we can look at the morphology of the radio emission and try to put constraints at least on the inclination if it was a, a jet model. Yeah, and then the, the next question also from Mark is, uh, if the gas is moving slower around the larger black hole because of time slowing, uh, does that mean the emission would be slower, would be lower too as the gas would be less energetic? That's a good question too. I don't think the emission is necessarily lower uh, because the, the gas temperatures are still really high and the gas temperatures and this uh, kind of spiraling of electrons around magnetic fields is what emits the, the radio waves that we observe. Not necessarily kind of the overall motion around the black hole, but really this kind of spiraling of electrons around magnetic fields. These are kind of the photons that are emitted from these electrons at high energy. These are the ones that we observe uh, from Earth. Uh, so it doesn't depend necessarily on, on the overall motion around the black hole, uh, but uh, it does help uh, because the gas around the black hole moving so slowly uh, as it orbits does help us in a way that the structure in the image doesn't change. Uh, over time, which means this aperture synthesis can uh, can work because we can combine uh, photons received at different times uh, into reproducing different parts of the image uh, as we use this aperture synthesis method. Uh, but the photons themselves, you know, just come from orbiting electrons around magnetic field lines. Okay, very good. So the uh, next question is from Peter. 
could the absence of a jet coming from Sagay tell us something about jet formation in general? Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, not finding a jet would be really interesting uh, if there really isn't one, because it would uh, I think put some constraints in the astrophysical modeling of Sagittarius A star, um, and kind of lead us to looking at cl closer differences between Sagittarius A star and M87. Uh, because so far, you know, the uh, GRMHD modeling uh, looks at lots of different astrophysical models uh, for, for the two black holes, and we can use the same models for both black holes. Uh, you just scale, they just scale in time and in mass, uh, but the same models could be valid to test on, on uh, observations. But if we could really pinpoint, you know, this class is Sagittarius A star, this class is M87, this would be really great because we can start to actually figure out what, what is the astrophysical component that quenches Sagittarius A star and jet compared to M87 uh, and, and what are these key differences. I think what will help us also greatly understand jet formation in general is expanding to more black holes. Because of course we have two now that we can compare. They're kind of vastly different in terms of uh, scale uh, and it would be great, you know, if we, when we go into space, we can probably probe, you know, a few more black holes uh, and their shadows and their jet properties and kind of piece together more than a just case by case basis, we can piece together more kind of survey properties of jet launching and black hole accretion. So I think that's a bit uh, further ahead, but it, it would be definitely really an important work to do. Mm -hmm. And then the, the next question is a tough one. Uh, when can we expect an image of that day? <laughs> I'm glad this wasn't the first question because in every talk I give, <laughs> it is always the first question. Well, uh, I think we're, we're working very hard and we really hope to have results really soon. Uh, I just hope that my talk at least gave some sense of why Sagittarius A star, well, is, is interesting in the first place. Uh, and how it's different from M87, both in what we can learn from it and also the challenges that we have to deal with in order to understand how it looks like at 1.3 millimeters. And that's kind of the work that we're doing right now in the EHT is really make sure that we fully understand our results before we can present them. And you know, there are many, many kind of loose threads that need to be tied, uh, tied up. And um, we hope that we'll have you know, a nice cohesive story to tell you about Sagittarius A star really, really soon. Okay, thank you. So I think this is the, the last question. So are we able to see and investigate the collision or circulation of two black holes by EHT experiment? Uh, the collision or what was the other word? Uh, circulation, circulating oh, like black, a holes. So binary black hole binaries. Black. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that uh, collision, uh, collision would be hard because what we observe are supermassive black holes and we probably have to have something really close by to be able to see it. And we don't think that there is a binary black, supermassive black hole binary really close by. Um, but there is one candidate supermassive black hole binary called OJ287. Uh, that is really interesting. And we have observed it with the EHT in 2017 and 2018. And I won't say much about it because there will be results on it pretty soon, but it, it's a very interesting source because it, it has this kind of kind of spirally jet that comes from it uh, that you know is probably caused by the rotation of, of uh, two supermassive black holes orbiting each other. Uh, so I would just say look forward to that because it will be, I think, pretty interesting. Okay, so I think that's all the questions we have. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah, for the for the great talk, uh, for the great presentation, and we got your very uh, a lot of interesting questions. So thank you very much thank for you. for answering that. Uh, but before we sign off, let me just repost the link to the survey in the chat. Uh, so to all the attendees, uh, please uh, fill out the survey because it will help us uh, improve our webinar uh, in the future. So uh, again, thank you everyone for attending. Thanks uh, Sarah again for the very nice talk. Thank you.